Well, hello again, Rush Church. Uh, we are continuing our study in the Sermon on the Mount. I think we are in week eight, I'm pretty sure. Uh, week, uh, week seven or week eight. And we've been looking at this, I don't want to call it a main address uh, from Jesus. I, I don't really think that that's what this is. I think his main address uh, to you and to me is to love one another. And his main address is to, uh, or is the resurrection. But I do think that this is uh, a major address talking about the Christian life, what it means uh, to follow Jesus, what it looks like. And, and, and remember, it's not, it's not exhaustive, okay? Uh, it is, there are examples of some of the things he's talking about in Scripture. This is not the, the totality of what it means to be a Christian man or a Christian woman. It just gives us examples. I think the, probably the best summary of what it means uh, to follow Jesus is what Jesus talks about um, multiple times uh, or, or multiple accounts of this. Uh, Paul talks about this, John talks about it, James talks about it, Peter talks about it, and that is uh, loving God, honoring God uh, with your life, with what you do, with what you think, how you act, uh, your attitude, uh, and also then showing love to people around you. Uh, I think that really is the structure that houses um, the, the gospel message. In fact, as Jesus it says, all of the law and the prophets, that is essentially all of the Old Testament, hang upon those two commands, love God and, and love each other, love people. Uh, so I think that's really the his, his main address, and we're going to talk about that actually a little bit uh, this Sunday. Um, but this is a major address giving an example of what it means to live out the character of Christ. And remember, all of this, a lot of this is turning, um, turning things uh, from the way people understood the law of God and this uh, this moral expectation of God. Uh, Jesus is not changing it. There, there's nothing about anything that Jesus is saying in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount that changes the Old Testament law. He is merely explaining... First of all, what it always meant, what it always pointed to, um, and also then pointing out where people have gotten it wrong, where you know, the teachers of the law and Pharisees and so forth have gotten it wrong, and because they've gotten it wrong, because teachers of the law have gotten it wrong, people trying to follow the law have gotten it wrong. Uh, it, it, it was, he's really trying to combat this, this, false idea of following the letter of the law uh, and, and assuming that that's going to save you instead of pursuing the spirit of the law, the meaning of the law, why we, excuse me, why we do it. And, and you know, what this, this law was always pointing to, it was always pointing to honoring God and loving people, loving God and loving people. And allowing that to show in our lives, uh, you know, th that's what this moral law was. Now, the, sacri uh, the sacrificial law, the judicial law, uh, all of that was pointing then towards Jesus and his death and his resurrection. Uh, but the moral law was all pointing to this uh, active, noticeable, uh, fruit-producing love of God and love of people. And he sets us up, really. He sets his listeners up um, 
and preparing us to receive uh, what it is he's about to say when he goes through the Beatitudes, and the, that is the blessings. You know, blessed are those, blessed are the poor in spirit, the blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then he addresses his listeners and he says, look, you guys are the salt of the earth. Uh, you guys are this incredibly valuable thing uh, that preserves preserves a love for God, a love for people, preserves the integrity of the word, uh, and your work goes in throughout the world. He goes on to say then, just as a recap, that Jesus is, that he is the fulfillment of the law. He came to fulfill the law and fulfilled the law in two ways. He fulfilled the law in his life his death and his resurrection, he also fulfilled, and, and he fulfilled that for you and I, which is why we put our hope, our faith, and our trust in Jesus. But he's also fulfilling the law in these other ways, and that is explaining uh, fully what the what the moral law meant and, and, and what its intent was. That's very, very important for us to remember as we then proceed to go through these examples. <clears throat> not the totality of the law. But as we go through these examples, he says, look, your righteousness needs to surpass that of the Pharisees. How does our righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees? Well, once again, it needs to go beyond just the acts of working out, the acts of, of living out the, the Old Testament law. It needs to be a change of heart. It needs to be a change of character. Uh, of attitude, of priority, you know, all of this stuff, uh, so that our love of God is strengthened and our love for people uh, is displayed because of our love for God. And so then he begins to, to uh, lay out some examples for us. And the first one he talked about, and you can see what he's talking about here, I think particularly when it comes to murder uh, and adultery. We're going to talk about adultery here in a second. But with murder, he says, you know, you, you've heard it written, or you, you've heard it said, don't kill people. That is physically take life, uh, unjustly take life, uh, or take life that is not yours to take. Uh, many people do end life uh, laws, uh, judges, governments end up doing that. Those, those institutions are in place to do that. Uh, that's not for you and I. Uh, to do on our own. And, and anyway, he says, you know, don't, you've heard it said, don't physically take a life. He said, but that's, if, if that's all you're doing, if that's, if that's all that law amounts to, you're getting it wrong. Jesus says, I'm talking about anger. I'm talking about rage. I'm talking about hate. I'm talking about fury towards others. You know, this, this all consuming anger, uh, whether it's to brothers and sisters in Christ or not doesn't matter. It's almost this mentality of, look, if you weren't even alive, I wouldn't care. Jesus says, that's what I'm talking about. That's what this was pointing to. This law was pointing to that. that that's murder. That's this, this destruction of a human being or the desire to destroy a human being without actually doing it. Remember, everything that we do God is not a God of our physical actions only. He is a God of everything. So everything Jesus talks about, or, or, or the stuff that Jesus is going to talk about as he breaks down the law, encompasses the whole person. There's no such thing as accepting Christ and not being changed, uh, uh, you know, your very nature being changed. You know, all that is is you know saying or professing that we accept Christ, and then changing the out the outward actions. There's much more to it than that. I mean, there's people who have followed the same law. You know, resisted the bad actions, participated in the good actions, and don't even know who Jesus is. Have never accepted Christ or have outright rejected Christ. And yet, they continue to do so many of the things in the law in their life. And so it's much more than just the outward action. 
It is the inward change that happens by the acceptance of Jesus and the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, by the focus upon Christ and the love of Christ, which then changes our mind. You're familiar with this. This has happened to you in the past when you've entered into a relationship with a person. You know, if I'm, if I'm well, I'm married now, but if I'm, you know, dating a girl who I find, you know, find out happens to love the color blue, well then everything I do starts to turn into blue. Everything I wear, everything I buy, I purchase, I, you know, gifts I give, whatever it is. And, and, and things begin to change in my own life and I begin, uh, uh, you know, to respond to this love and this care for this other person because of their desires and their will and their wants. Well, that's important for us. Uh, when it comes to our relationship with God, it starts with our love and reverence for God. And so murder, you know, being equated to hate and rage and anger and fury and this, 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 um, just this consuming um, hatred for somebody, that, that's not going to make sense to equate that to murder unless we completely love and put our hope and our faith in a God who does not like violence in the heart. Then all of a sudden, if we believe that, if we give our lives over to that, then we begin to understand and we start connecting these dots, how violence in the heart is just as, pretend, just as dangerous and just as horrible and just as evil as violence physically leads to horrible things. It leads to personal destruction. I mean, let's just, if we can, let's forget about everybody else just for a second. It leads to personal uh, decay. Well, not only does God want what's good for those around us, he wants what's good for us too. And so he doesn't want us to be consumed by murderous thoughts, feelings, certainly not murderous actions. And so he used murder as an example. Now he goes on to use adultery as an example and and one that i think that uh, once again once you begin to understand the character of christ it's then that you start putting these together and 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 these things start making a little bit more sense um jesus goes on to say in chapter 5 verse 27 of chapter 5 he, is, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, we know that. We hear that from the Old Testament law, Exodus chapter 20. He goes on to say, what's he doing? He's, we tend to think he's ratcheting it up. He's, he's uh, you know, changing it into something more intense. That's not what he's doing. He is, he is resetting this this moral standard he's resetting this moral bar uh, it was lowered it was lowered in people's practice of the law and i don't want it to be lowered in your life either it was it was merely the outward action that mattered instead of the entire person the attitude the inward heart he says you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery but i tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, lustfully. And again, obviously, I, I think this goes without saying, this is written to the masculine. Um, this goes both ways, men and women. Um, anybody who looks at, at a man, anybody who looks at a woman, uh, lustfully. Uh, and, and so we see that Jesus is telling us, look, yeah, the, the, the do not commit adultery was the law, but the, that, that law was always meaning, it always meant from the very beginning, do not be consumed by lust in your heart towards other people. Very hard, very difficult moral standard, isn't it? You know, we are, we are bombarded uh, daily with temptations to lust and 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 I would go so far as to say intentional 
temptations to lust. I mean, you've probably heard it said before, and maybe you've used it before, sex sells, right? Sex sells. And there is this, there is this plan, you know, intentional things that are put in place um, by human beings to tempt other people, other human beings to lust. Now, I'm not blaming them for my lustful heart. What I'm saying is, what I'm trying to get across is it's very, very difficult um, you know, to live out this life without lust. It's possible. It's possible. And I think you see this First of all, as people grow into their relationship with Christ, um, as they grow into a love of and a love for Jesus, um, these, these things begin uh, to be easier to deal with because of our desire uh, for the object of our love, which is Christ. Um, I, see, I think you see this in relationships between two people. Uh, you know, when a husband and wife love and honor one another, right? Love and honor one another. Part of that love and honor is to resist the temptations of lust, to resist the temptations of adultery. And once again, it's more than, it, it, this is really the point that Jesus is trying to drive home through all this, so we have to get this. Or else we've missed it. We've missed the entire thing here. If we don't get this, that's why I'm going to keep saying it. It's more than just the action. It's more than just the... Now, that's not to suggest that the action is unimportant. But it's much more than just the action. It is the motivation behind the action. It's the motivation of your life. It's the motivation of the sin. It's the priorities that you have in your life. The condition of your, your inner person, right? We've talked about this before, the inner man, the inner woman. It's that condition that is most important. And why not? Because as the inner person, as that condition is, so are the actions going to be. And so it's much more than just not committing adultery. That is more, not committing physical acts of, of adultery or fornication or whatever it might be. But it is the desire to, where we've crossed this line, to go from pursuing the character of Christ to being apart from the character of Christ. Uh, we are sinful people. Our nature causes us to be sinful people. Um, and we need to be on guard against the fact that that sinful nature can cause us to sin. Remember, sinfulness and sins, those, 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 that's not the same thing, all right? Sinful is the condition of the person, the nature of the person. But that doesn't mean that they are committing sin. Uh, committing sin is giving yourself over to lustful thoughts, lustful actions, and physical actions of adultery. So you don't commit adultery. Um, and, and one of the reasons, or one of the ways <clears throat> that we avoid and we begin to change, it's, it's an intentional thing, uh, that we avoid and begin to change not just the action, but the thought, is you, you have to stop feeding the sinful condition. You see, that's... That's where we make our mistakes sometimes. We get upset about the sinful condition. We get upset about the temptations and the struggles of sin. We get upset about the temptations to lust, the temptations to commit adultery. That's what lust is, right? We've established that. We get upset about the temptations to commit adultery, and yet... There are many times and ways and places in which we feed we feed this this sinful nature. We feed 
the temptation by things we see, things we participate in, actions that we have, actions that we, we, we perform, moments of, of, of thought, you know, um, Sometimes when we are idle and our thoughts are not consumed, there's nothing wrong with solitude, there's nothing wrong with silence. One of these days we'll talk about those two things as far as spiritual disciplines. But sometimes we entertain thoughts and, and uh, you know imaginations and things like that when we are idle. Uh, instead of filling those times with um, meditation, Filling those times with prayer, filling those times with study, filling those times with conversation, conversation with objects of your your affection, objects of your love, spouse, Christ, people that we can engage in conversation with, and so and and, and I know sometimes it's it's hard uh, to resist feeding lustful thoughts and sinful nature because. As we've already mentioned, it's around us all the time. It's all over the place. Uh, but there are things, you know, that are possibly in your life um, where you can resist feeding uh, that which you want to die. You want to eliminate uh, sin in your life. Because there's a point at which, again, you have to ask the question, not just the what, but the why. You know, we can be tempted and not sin in that temptation. But, but I would submit to you that after we have accepted Christ, being tempted and not sinning, not following through with that temptation, I, I would almost submit to you that that's step one. I mean, that's 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 expected. That's um, you know that that's a, a a normal response to giving your life over to Christ. Eventually, I think we need to get to a point where we're at where we have to ask ourselves, why am I even tempted? Why now, after so many uh, you know <clears throat> years or whatever it may be in my walk with Christ? Why am I still tempted over some of the things that I was tempted by prior to Christ? That's where we start turning this up. And that's where we start looking at our spiritual maturity. There are things today that I am not tempted by that I once was. There are other things today that I'm still tempted by. And I am, thankfully, it's taken 38 years but I am thankfully at that place now where I'm confronting the question, why am I even tempted? Why am I not growing in this desire uh, and, and, and drive and want and love to be like Christ? Um, or what can I do to feed that desire to be like Christ? So I think I think we need to get to that place in our lives, and that's a good that's a good question to begin wrestling with when you're talking about adultery, when you're talking about lust, when you're talking about all these sins that begin in the mind and in the heart, finish out in the physical act, but they begin internally. Why at this point am I even tempted by that? Because there's some things we don't like. We know they're wrong. We don't like them. We don't want to play around with them. We don't want to dabble with them. And because of that, we're not tempted by them. You know, um, I'm not tempted to, you know, go out on a bender one weekend. It's just not a, it's not a thing. It's just not a temptation. That's something I want. It's like, I know the results of that. I, 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 I know that it's harmful. I know that others love me and care about me. I, I know that it, 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 uh, there's just not the desire there. There's not the temptation. So why then? How can we get there with some things in life and we can't get there with other things in life? 
And I do believe it's because of a particular uh, focus that we have in that area of life when it comes to our relationship with Christ. The more we grow into being like Jesus and want to be like Jesus, the more we read about him and see his character, the closer we become to our spouse, our families, the more we express the love of Christ to others, the, the less and less even the temptation is uh, to pursue things that are outside the character of Christ. And sometimes we need to take some drastic steps uh, to keep from coveting. I mean, that, that's what adultery is. Um, covetousness. You know, I, I, I see uh, something uh, that I want and I don't have it and I want it. Um, maybe you think you should have it. Maybe you don't think you should have it. But it's this deep-seated desire um, a complete lack of contentment in your life or in that particular area of your life. It's covetousness. And Paul wrestled with this. You know, it was, it, in fact, he uses um, coveting. Um, that's the way the Old Testament, that's the way the law puts it. Don't covet, covet your neighbor's wife or don't covet your neighbor's husband. And Paul talks about, you know, coveting. And how he, he understood what it was, or began to understand what it was, began to understand that it was law, based upon the law, even though he, you know, often teaches that we live in a time of grace through Jesus Christ, and not through the various actions of the law. Um, but coveting something or someone is really this root of adultery, uh, this root of lust. And it is lust, by the way, not, not recognizing and appreciating beauty. Okay, those are two different things. And, and, and I have it straight in my head, it's just hard to explain. Um, it's easier to explain if you don't use a person. You know, I'm a car guy, I like cars, I think Probably all guys on some level, car guy. Um, and I appreciate neat stuff. I like it. You know, I'll go to a car show and I'll look at it and, you know, check it out. See the beauty of it, you know, all this stuff. Um, and I do appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. And again, it's just easier to talk about cars than it is to talk about people. Um, so I'm using that as an example. But it's not something that I dwell upon. You know, I want that. You know, I imagine myself with it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to be content unless I have it, unless I experience it and use it, you know. Because eventually the shine's going to wear off of it anyway, right? Boy, maybe now we are talking about adultery. Maybe now we are talking about lust and not cars. There is this, this um, appreciation that we can have uh, for beauty, uh, moral beauty, spiritual beauty, physical beauty. Um, and, but it is the dwelling upon, you know, it's where the imagination gets involved where the want gets involved. That's where we start getting into lust. That's where we start getting into uh, adultery. Um, some people have, have put it this way. Uh, I don't know if this is completely accurate, but I like the way it sounds. Lust is not the first look, it's the second. No, it's not the first look, it's the second. It's not the recognition it's the dwelling upon. And I think that's really uh, what adultery is. I think that's really what lust is. Remember, call it what it is. Call it adultery. Because if we don't, then we're going to allow that
that seed of adultery to begin to grow in our heart. And I'm telling you, it's a tough one. If we allow, allow that to take root, it's a tough addiction. An addiction uh, to eliminate in our lives. So Jesus is resetting the bar here when it comes to adultery. He says it's not just the act, which is what the Pharisees taught, what the teachers of the law taught. They said, well, it's just the act. You can think anything you want. You can do anything you want. Or you can think anything you want. You can feel anything you want. So long as you don't act upon it. Jesus says, I, I, that's not what that meant. It's a condition of the heart. By the way, Jesus wrote the law. Okay? He is God. He says, I know my law. I'm going to lay it out for you. They taught it was just the act. Uh, it's much more than just the physical. You can't separate the physical and the spiritual when it comes to your life now. They're connected. And Jesus is, is the God of all of them. And so you resist lust. You resist this temptation to feed it. You resist adultery. And there are things we have to do in life um, which maybe you've done before. I know I have. I know I have. There are things that we have to do to prevent ourselves from feeding what is evil. Um, sometimes it is fleeing temptation, right? Sometimes it is cutting people out of your life. Sometimes it's cutting you out of their life, which is different. You know, I don't, I don't, a good example might be having a job where you're constantly tempted by adultery. Well, there's one place where you can cut people out of your life. You know, um, you can eliminate that role in that position. Um, you can take yourself away uh, from that job, from that area, from that, that way of life. And if we think of it that way, we begin to understand how it can be very, very difficult, very, very hard to remove ourselves from a bad situation or remove a bad situation from us. It's not always easy to perform spiritual surgery. But sometimes we need to do that instead of feeding the sinful nature. And that's what Jesus says in verse 29. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He, he, he says this twice. Anytime Jesus says something twice, you want to pay attention. Anytime he says something twice, you better sit up and recognize what it is he's saying. He talks about this twice. He uses the right side to show importance. In this time and in this day, uh, the right eye, the right hand, uh, you know, a, a strong right arm, even we talk about that. It, it, it's, a, it's a symbol of importance, symbol of something very, very valuable. And Jesus, that's why he uses this, uh, the right side. He says, you know, no matter what you think may be of importance or may be valuable in your life, if it stands between you and Christ, it has to be dealt with. <clears throat> and you need to, it either needs to be eliminated or you need to remove yourself from the situation. Sometimes friends do this. Sometimes it's places. Sometimes it's uh, hobbies. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, actions that we're involved in. <coughs> but where it gets difficult, I think, is where it's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where it's friends or family. 
when they stand between you and Christ, when they tempt you to deny the character of Christ, to deny your right to sanctification. And those things need to be removed. Again, think of it as covetousness, the object um, that you're coveting, the, you know, again, used cars, the, the, you know, shiny, rebuilt, classic car, you know, it's almost as if you need to, hey, you need to tell somebody, hey, take it away, take it away, or you need to leave, right, to separate yourself uh, from even something that is beautiful in order that you don't lose all of yourself. Jesus here, by the way, <coughs> he's not talking about self-mutilation, okay, uh, which apparently um, actually went on uh, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, people thinking that by chastising the physical body, they were somehow uh, honoring the command of Christ. Well, that's that's not what Jesus is talking about here. The, the, the whole purpose of this is for us not to hurt ourselves uh, and hurt each other. Uh, he's just making the point that there are things in your life that you consider very, very important and very, very valuable. And he equates this. He, he's bringing this into the conversation uh, with adultery because we, we want it. I mean, we like it. It, it. It's a draw. It's a temptation. It's a strong attraction. He doesn't bring this into the conversation when we talk about murder, although the same thing applies. He brings it in when he talks about adultery. And sometimes we need to remove ourselves from the situation or from people that cause us to deny Christ. Uh, I have in the past. Um, and some of those relationships over time uh, have mended. In fact, not only have they mended, they've become stronger. Um, others, were, others were lost. And it was difficult at first. Um, but then your, you know, your outlook on life, your love for Christ, your priorities change. And you begin to see uh, that that you know separating yourself from those temptations is beneficial for you, beneficial for um, those around you, your family, and all of those things. And look, all of this stuff we can agree to. All of this stuff, you know, when it comes to a a Bible study on a on a, on a, on a video, we can we can nod our heads with. But what happens when it does hit home? I mean, what happens when we do take this to heart? What happens when we go to the office and we are confronted by lust for our coworker? In other words, we are confronted with adultery right then and there. Now it gets a little harder. Now we're talking about you know, making a, a dramatic change in our life, whether it's, who knows, a restructuring of roles and responsibilities or restructuring of of uh, the office, or whether it is even eliminating uh, the job that you have so that you're not tempted, whether it's a hard conversation. And through it all, it is admitting to those around you the truth. And what is the truth? It's not because of the fact that you are here. It's because of the fact that I am expressing, I am living out my weakness. Wow. That's a tough cut. Who's got the problem? I have the problem. That's a tough conversation to have. We'll run into that here, by the way. I work with Cody. Um, no problems like that around here. But you may run into, uh, you know, take it seriously. Um, you may run into things like that in your life. 
Um, but we do need to act upon those. That's what Jesus is saying. Because you're going to lose yourself. And from here on out, call it what it is. Call it what it is. It is adultery. It is adultery. Lust of the eyes, lust of the mind, lust of the heart is adultery. And somebody needs to ask at some point. We're going to talk about divorce here. We're going to talk about marital unfaithfulness. We're going to talk about sexual immorality. Someone needs to ask at some point now, am I being faithful? Have I given up on my relationships or marriage? Let me, let me read, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but let me, let me read this first. Verse 31, Jesus is talking about divorce. He says, and by the way, that's not a coincidence that he follows up adultery with divorce. <clears throat> Verse 31, he says, it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. We'll break that down a little bit later. But what I want to key in on is, he says, look, I don't want divorce. Okay, I'm going to give a concession. I'm going to give a concession, and that is sexual immorality. If one of them is guilty of sexual immorality, okay. But that's it. Now we go back to lust. Let's back up a second. What is lust? Committing adultery. I mean, we look at a, a couple, we look at a husband and a wife, and, and we, we hear about one of them, you know, going out, leaving the home, going to another home, and sleeping around. And we think, well, how horrible that is. And we talk to the other person. Well, are you going to forgive them? Can you forgive them? Is this the end of this marriage? Are you going to separate yourself from all this stuff? But haven't we just read that lust of the mind and the heart and the eyes is adultery? And so... Particularly if you're married, this applies whether you're married or not. But particularly if you're married, I, I think you need to ask the question if it's something that you not only are tempted by, but it's something you act upon. If you're acting upon that temptation in your mind and in your heart, if you're entertaining that, you then need to ask the question of yourself, do I in fact love and honor my spouse? Would we call the guy that goes out and sleeps around physically, would we call that someone who loves and honors his spouse? No. Would we call that someone who, is, who has given their life to Christ? No. So why are, we, why are we inventing lines here? Why are we making up our own rules as we go? It's called rationalization. I'm inventing stuff to make it easier to swallow. It's adultery. It's being unfaithful in your marriage. I realize that we live in a day and in a culture where even adultery is looked at as minor. You know, again, going back to, um, you know, <laughs> It just, it cracks me up how we think we have progressed. You know, as a world, society, culture, here we are going back to exactly what Jesus was, was upset with. The, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. So long as you don't physically hurt someone. So long as you don't physically do it. 
it's not that big of a deal. Well, that's what we think now. 2,000 years ago, we're no further ahead. It's a, it's, a, it's a culture that you are immersed in that takes adultery very lightly. And this is where you either determine that you are a part of a holy nation or you're not. A holy nation, that is followers of Christ. All over the world. From all walks of life whether you're a part of that holy nation or not. There's a lot of people, friends, family, relatives, neighbors, that may not be a part of that holy nation. They're in your life, they influence your life. You love them and you should show love to them. But you also need to look after the condition of your heart condition of your mind. Adultery and lust. Do not separate the two. Jesus does not separate the two. This is going to feed into divorce. I mean, this is one of the reasons Jesus talks about giving a certificate of divorce <clears throat> Is, is because husbands, remember, women could not divorce in that day and in that time. They didn't have a right to. Husbands could. Husbands were looking lustfully at others, coveting others, divorcing a spouse. And now what happens is that spouse, that wife, and many cases children, are left now at the mercy of the world, some even being accused of marital unfaithfulness, even though they weren't. Then the man goes on to pursue the object of his lust until that shine wore off, and then that was a divorce. That's That was the progression. That, that's one of the reasons uh, why... Moses gave this concession. God gave this concession through Moses uh, to give a certificate of divorce to then protect and, and try and feed some rights back to this woman who has been wronged in this divorce. Uh, so th that follows this discussion on adultery uh, because that was the root of some of the divorce problems in the Old Testament and the Old Testament law carried over, of course, in the New Testament. Uh, so we'll talk about divorce. I want to get into, actually, everything I have right here is, this is all for the next section. Um, I expected to get into that, but uh, I don't have the time to actually get into that study at this point. I didn't think adultery was going to take quite this long. Uh, but we'll talk about divorce next time, um, and then we go into uh, not just uh, not just the condition of our hearts and actions, but the words that we say, the words that we say when we go into oaths. Um, we'll, we'll, there's a number of things that we can look at, but but we're also going to see how. Sometimes turning the other cheek, we've heard that, turning on the other cheek also. Sometimes we misinterpret that uh, in a way it was never meant to be. And we do ourselves, as well as, well as others, a lot of harm when we look at uh, eye for an eye, when we look at love for enemies, and so forth. So we've still got a ways to go um, through chapter 5, and then we'll get into chapter 6. I want to get to prayer. Prayer is probably going to take a long time. To go through that'll probably be a two week uh two separate uh, uh week lesson for prayer um but i want to leave you with with this when it comes to adultery remember lust and adultery jesus makes no no distinction between the two it's the same thing 
you need to recognize that it's the same thing. Regardless of what anybody else is going to tell you, who, who do you follow? Who do you follow? Do you follow the Word? Or do you follow anyone and everything else that does not follow the Word? Adultery and lust being the same thing. If it's something you struggle with, um, first of all, if it's something you struggle with, you're not alone. But if it's something you struggle with, you need to do what is necessary to stop feeding the temptation and sometimes perform some spiritual surgery, which is much easier said than done. Although I have done it, and it can be done. Uh, but next time we'll get into divorce and then oaths, which goes along with not using the name of the Lord in vain. So until then, I'll uh, see you next week.